In this reflection, I'd like to return to chapter 15 of Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal, to revisit notions of friendship, the unconsciousness, how it relates to Sigmund Freud's work, and the connections between evolutionary psychology. Let's see what Wright has to say. Wright tells us that we spend our lives desperately seeking status. We are addicted to social esteem in a fairly literal sense, dependent upon the neurotransmitter rewards we get by impressing people. We are all self-promoters and social climbers. The point here, Wright says, is that our generosity and affection have a narrow underlying purpose. They are aimed either at kin who share our genes, at non-kin of the opposite sex who can help package our genes for shipment to the next generation, or at non-kin of either sex who seem likely to return any favor that we ask of them in a reciprocal altruistic sense. What's more, Wright adds, the favor often entails dishonesty or malice. We do our friends the favor of overlooking their flaws and seeing, if not magnifying, the flaws of their enemies. Affection, then, is a tool of hostility. We form bonds to deepen fissures. The upshot is, is that our friendships in our friendships. We are deeply an egalitarian. We value especially the affection of high status people and are willing to pay more for it, to expect less of them and to judge them more leniently. Wright reminds us that Freudians found sly, unconscious aims in our most innocent acts, and like the new Darwinians, uh, they saw an animal essence at the core of the unconscious. Both Freudians and Darwinians um, believe that a large part of a person's motives are in fact unconscious. They view the conscious person at least as a kind of unwitting accomplice. Wright tells us that Freud thought of himself as a Darwinian in that he tried to look at the human mind as a product of evolution. But Wright adds Freud actually misunderstood evolution in basic and elementary ways. He put too much emphasis, for example, on the Lamarckian idea that traits acquired through experience actually get passed on biologically to progeny. But, Wright adds, some of Freud's misconceptions were actually common in his day, and in fact, some of these were held by Darwin himself. Freud was right to sense that relatives and parents in particular have a lot to say about the shape of an emerging psyche. Parents were not wholly benign. Deep conflicts between parents and offspring were certainly possible. For example, Wright says that at a younger age, a boy may have a paternal conflict that's over the mother. But an evolutionary psychologist would not attribute a Freudian Oedipan explanation of sex as its goal. Rather, the son and the father are fighting over the mother's valuable time and attention. If the struggle has sexual overtones at all, they are only that the father's genetic interests may call for impregnating the mother, while the sons would call for delaying the arrival of a sibling. Wright admits that these sorts of Darwinian themes are often speculative, and at this early stage in the development of evolutionary psychology, uh, meagerly tested. But unlike Freud's theory, they are tethered to something firm, and that is an understanding of the process that designed the human brain. What Freud got right was his sensing the paradox of us being uh, highly social animals. Being at our core is individuals libidinous, rapacious, and generally selfish. We must live our lives, however, with other human beings, and must reach our animal goals by a torturous path of cooperation, compromise, and restraint. From this insight, Wright tells us, flows Freud's most basic idea about the mind, and that is that it is a place of conflict between animal impulses and social reality. All told, then, Freud's scorecard is not bad from an evolutionary psychologist's perspective. He rightly saw the mind as a place of turbulence, much of it subterranean. And, in a general way, he saw the source of this turbulence, too. An animal of utterly complete ruthlessness is born into a complex and inescapable social web. 
the point here is that uh, repression and the unconscious mind are actually the products of millions of years of evolution and were well developed long before civilization further complicated our mental lives. All told, the new Darwinian paradigm allows us to think clearly about how these things were designed over these millions of years. That is, the theories of kin selection, parent offspring conflict, parental investment, reciprocal altruism, and status hierarchy tell us what kinds of self-deception are and aren't likely to be favored by evolution. That said, it's important to note that the Darwinian notion of the unconscious is more radical than the Freudian one. Wright tells us that the sources of self-deception are more numerous, diverse, and deeply rooted, and the line between the conscious and the unconscious is certainly less clear. Freud described Freudianism as an attempt to prove to the ego that each one of us is not even the master of his or her own house. But by Darwinian light, this wording almost gives too much credit to the notion of self. Indeed, Wright explains, the common sense way of thinking about our thoughts and feelings on one hand and our pursuit of goals on the other is not just wrong it's backwards. To this picture Freud would add that we often have goals that we aren't aware of, goals that may get pursued in bleak and counterproductive ways, and our perception of the world may get warped in that process. But if evolutionary psychology is on track, Wright explains, the whole picture needs to be turned inside out. We believe the things about morality, about personal worth, and even objective truth because in an evolutionary sense these are the things that led to behaviors that got our genes into the next generation. The point that Wright makes here is that if Freud stressed the people's difficulty in seeing the truth about themselves, the new Darwinians stress the difficulty of seeing the truth, period. Indeed, Darwinism comes close to calling into question the very meaning of the word truth, for the social discourses that supposedly led to truth really are, by Darwinian lights, raw power struggles. Thus, Wright concludes, the difficult question of whether the human animal can really be a moral animal may seem increasingly quaint. The question may be whether, after the new Darwinian paradigm takes root, the word moral, like the word truth, can be anything but a joke. <laughs>